Happy Thursday, November 2nd, 2023. Time for an after work story. Listen, I'm going to stay up here and read because I am lazy and I happen to have this book up here with me. And it's called Rosa. And this is by Nikki Giovanni, illustrated by Brian Collier. So, yeah, we're familiar with this story. Some people say I look like Rosa Parks. And I have my glasses on. I don't know about that. Let's see. Mm -mm. No, I don't see it. But anyway, she's someone definitely to admire. And we love the illustrations here. Oh, it's beautiful. I remember making a painting of the bus also. And it's in my room. Probably, what, six feet by five feet or maybe seven feet yeah on a board look at this look at the expressions Woo! excellent illustrations uh someone was reading the story about emmett till the newspaper the life of oh we've been through so much we've been through so much but we have resilience in us and well, let's, let's read the author's note. Rosa Parks is a cooling breeze on a sweltering day, a sun-dried quilt in fall. The enchantment of snowflakes extending the horizon, the promise of renewal at spring. It is an honor and a responsibility to explore the bravery of her acceptance of history's challenge. And the illustrator's note is, in researching the story, I made a trip in August 2004 to Montgomery and Selma. When I arrived in Alabama, the first thing I noticed was the heat. That is why my paintings for this book have a yellow, sometimes dark hue. I wanted the reader to feel in that heat, a foreshadowing, an uneasy quiet before the storm. Mm, we were talking about weather yesterday rainstorms and torrential downpours even though the story of rosa parks and the bus boycott began in montgomery alabama in 1955 it did not end there many future marchers in selma and elsewhere throughout the country over the next decade were inspired by the courage of mrs rosa parks in my paintings mrs parks looks as if light is emanating from her, to me, she is like a radiant chandelier, an elegant light that illuminates all of our many pathways. Yeah, well, I'll say so far, these paintings are magnificent. So great job, Brian Collier. All right, let's dive in. Ooh, look at this. Mrs. Parks was having... I think I'm going to have to tilt this. Mrs. Parks was having a good day. Mother was getting over that touch of flu and was up this morning for breakfast at the table. Her husband, Raymond Parks, one of the best barbers in the country, had been asked to take on extra work at the Air Force Base. And the first day of December was always special because you could just feel Christmas in the air. Just like yesterday was the first day of November and you can feel Thanksgiving in the air. Well, yeah, anticipation all around. Everybody knew the alterations department would soon be very, very busy. Mrs. Parks would laugh each year with the other seamstresses and say that those elves in the North Pole have nothing on us. The women of Montgomery, both young and older, would come in with their fancy holiday dresses that needed adjustments or their Sunday suits and blouses that needed just a touch, a flower or some velvet trimming or something to make the ladies look festive. Mmm, this is wonderful. Rosa Parks was the best seamstress. The needle and thread flew through her hands like the gold spinning from Rumpelstiltskin's loom. The other seamstresses would tease Rosa Parks and say she used magic. Rosa would say, Rosa would laugh, not magic, just concentration. Mm -hmm. And she would say someday she would skip lunch to be finished on time. Oh, she was a hard worker. Are you a hard worker? Yeah, it's a good feeling when you put your all into something and then 
you can play hard. This Thursday, ah, just like today, they had gotten a bit ahead of their schedule. Why don't you go on home, Rosa, said the supervisor. I know your mother is feeling poorly and you might want to look in on her. The supervisor knew Rosa would stay until the work was done, but it was only December 1st. No need to push. Rosa appreciated that. Now she could get home early, and since Raymond would be working late, maybe she would surprise him with a meatloaf, his favorite. Aww. Isn't that wonderful? See you in the morning, Rosa waved goodbye and headed for the bus stop. She fiddled in her pocket for the dime so that she would not have to ask for change. When she stepped up to drop her fare in, she was smiling in anticipation of a nice dinner she would make. As was the evil custom, she then got off the bus and went to the back door to enter the bus from the rear. Huh. I always thought that they could just put the fare in and then just walk back. Didn't know that you had to step away, go to the back, and then re-enter. Isn't that some foolishness? Huh. Rosa saw that the section reserved for blacks was full, but she noticed the neutral section, the part of the bus where blacks or whites could sit, had free seats. The left side of the aisle had two seats, and on the right side, a man was sitting next to the window. Rosa decided to sit next to him. She did not remember his name, but she knew his face. His son, Jimmy, came frequently to the NAACP Youth Council Affairs. They exchanged pleasantries as the bus pulled away from the curb. Rosa settled her sewing bag and her purse near to her knees, trying not to crowd Jimmy's father. Men take up more space, she was thinking as she tried to squish her packages closer. The bus made several more stops and the two seats opposite her were filled by blacks. She sat on her side of the aisle, daydreaming about her good day and planning her special meal for her hubby Raymond. Oh. Uh-oh. I said, give me those seats. I'm like, did we skip something? I said, give me those seats, the bus driver bellowed. Mrs. Parks looked up in surprise. The two men on the opposite side of the aisle were rising to move into the crowded black section. Jimmy's father muttered, more to himself than anyone else, I don't feel like trouble today. I'm going to move. Mrs. Parks stood to let him out looked at James Blake, the bus driver, and then sat back down. Oh, yes, he did. You better make it easy on yourself, Blake yelled. Why do you pick on us, Mrs. P Parks asked with that quiet strength of hers. I'm going to call the police, Blake threatened. Do what you must, Mrs. Parks quietly replied. She was not frightened. She was not going to give in to that which was wrong. Some of the white people were saying aloud, she ought to be arrested and take her off this bus. Some of the black people recognizing the potential for ugliness. Ah, that word, yeah. They got off the bus because they knew something was about to go down. Others stayed on saying among themselves, that is the neutral section. She has a right to be there. And Mrs. Parks said, Oh, remember it's a late fall day. And look at this. Can you see the face in the trees? I see it. Maybe you can't. But this is such a masterful illustrator. Mm. As Mrs. Parks sat waiting for the police to come. She thought of all the brave men and women, boys and girls who stood tall for civil rights. She recited in her mind the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision in which the United States Supreme Court ruled that separate is inherently unequal. She sighed as she realized she was tired, not tired from work, but tired of putting white people first. Tired of stepping off sidewalks to let white people pass. Tired of eating at separate lunch counters and learning at separate schools. She was tired of colored entrances, colored balconies, colored drinking fountains, and colored taxis. 
She was tired of getting somewhere first and being waited on last. Tired of separate and definitely tired of not equal. She thought about her mother and her grandmother and knew they would want her to be strong. She, not, she had not sought this moment, but she was ready for it. When the policeman bent down to ask, Auntie, are you going to move? All the strength of all the people through all those many years joined in her. Raise Rosa Parks said no. Joanne Robinson was at the Piggly Wiggly when she learned of the arrest. She had stopped in to purchase a box of macaroni and cheese. She always served macaroni and cheese when she baked red snapper for dinner. A sister member of the Women's Political Council approached her just as she reached the checkout lane. Not Mrs. Parks, Mrs. Robinson explained. Exclaimed. She then looked furtively around, passed the word that everybody should meet me at my office at 10 o'clock tonight, she said. Mrs. Robinson was also Dr. Robinson, a professor at Alabama State, the college designated for quote-unquote colored people. And she was the newly elected president of the Women's Political Council. She rushed home to put dinner on the table, cleaned up the kitchen, and put the kids to bed. She kissed her husband goodbye and hurried to the college. It was dark when they finally gathered. Isn't that something? They were taking care of the business, took care of the family, was a career woman, Cleaned the home, cooked. Wow. I tell you, they were able to do it a lot of times, do it all. The 25 women first held hands in prayer, yes, in hopes that they were doing the right thing. After all, they were going to use the stencil maker, printer, and paper of Alabama State without permission. If they were caught at the college, they all could be arrested for trespassing but they were working to undermine a vicious law. They decided they would stand under the umbrella of courage. Rosa Parks had offered helping off the reins of fear and self-disgust. The women quickly formed groups to carry out each task. Making the stencils was the most difficult because the machine keys had to be struck very hard so that the letters would be clearly readable. If a mistake was made, the whole page had to be thrown out and it took a lot of concentration. See the collage work? So he used paintings. Oh my goodness, this is beautiful. Mixed media. The posters read, no writers today. Support Mrs. Park, stay off the buses. Walk on Monday. The women made enough posters for almost every citizen of color in Montgomery. The next morning, as people read the posters, they re remembered the joy they felt when the Supreme Court declared that separate was not equal. They were sure that once the highest court in the land had spoken, they would not be treated so badly. But that was not the case. Soon after the ruling, Emmett Till, a 14-year-old boy in Money, Mississippi, was viciously lynched. At his funeral, more than 100,000 people mourned with his mother. Did you hear me? 100,000. That's 100, zero, zero, zero. Oh, she left his casket open saying, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. Now, only weeks after his killers were freed. Did you hear me? Freed. Rosa Parks have taken a courageous stand. The people were ready to stand with her. Courage, confidence. They came together in a great mass meeting, the Women's Political Council, the NAACP, and all the churches. They needed someone to speak for them, to give voice to the injustice. Everyone agreed that the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. would be ideal. We will stay off the buses, Dr. King intoned. We will walk until justice runs down like water and righteousness like a mighty stream. Is that from Amos? I think so in the Bible. People from all over the United States sent shoes and coats and money so that the citizens of Montgomery could walk. Everyone was proud of their nonviolent movement and the sole force that bound the community together was sustain many marches for the years of struggle that were to come. Talking about some resilience. Ooh, look at this. Look at this, you all. 
And the people walked, they walked in the rain. They had umbrellas and some of them didn't have umbrellas. They walked in the hot sun. They walked early in the morning. They walked late at night. They walked at Christmas and they walked at Easter. They walked on the 4th of July. They walked on Labor Day. They walked on Thanksgiving. And then it was almost Christmas again. They still walked. You see that? Beautiful. Edmund Pettus Bridge. They walked and walked and walked. People from all over the United States sent shoes and coats and money so that the citizens of Montgomery could walk. Everyone was proud of their nonviolent movement and the soul force that bound the community together would sustain many marches for the years of struggle that were yet to come. They stuck together, they supported one another, they encouraged each other. Look at this. On, December, on November 13, 1956, so that's what, 11 days from now, that would have been 67 years ago. Almost a year after the arrest of Rosa Parks, the Supreme Court of the United States ruled that segregation on the buses, like segregation at schools, was illegal. Segregation was wrong. Rosa Parks said no, that the Supreme Court could remind the nation that the Constitution of the United States makes no provision for second-class citizenship. We are all equal under the law and are all entitled to its protection. That's right even on the buses. How about that? The integrity, the dignity, the quiet strength of Rosa Parks turned her into a yes for change. Beautiful. Support Ms. Parks. Wasn't this a beautiful book? Ah, so where do you need to be courageous? Where do you need to take a stand? Or where do you need to, what areas in life do you need to be more resilient? Let's remind ourselves who we are, where we come from. It doesn't matter what color you are, your nationality. It's within you to do great things. Stand up for a right, for justice and not injustice. Hmm? Love mercy and to walk humbly before everyone. All right, but still take a stand. Have a great evening making a difference.